that. Got your thoughts and questions, ideas as we go along, but don't hold back. If you have a burning question, uh, please engage. And uh, brief introduction here. In some ways, Vermont has fared better than other rural states in keeping our communities livable for people of all ages and disabilities and maintaining working local economies. <coughs> Yet, global warming, peak fossil fuels, and shifting populations and demographics mean that challenges for rural communities uh, won't be going away anytime soon. So, what defines a livable community in Vermont it can mean different things to different people. Uh, borrowing from AARP and the Vermont Council on Rural Development, uh, some criteria worth considering include safety and security, affordable and appropriate housing and transportation options, supportive community features and services, an innovative and vibrant local economy, citizens who are engaged in community building and governance, communities that attract youth, entrepreneurs, and healthy diversity. Young citizens are fully prepared to contribute to their communities and participate successfully in a changing economy. Rural character and open lands are conserved and managed productively and profitably. <clears throat> communities, businesses, and citizens prosper by designing and building economic solutions to climate change. So there's a lot there. There's plenty more, I'm sure, uh, in your mind. So indeed, many solutions to climate change have multiple benefits uh, that can make communities more livable and strengthen local economies. Uh, on the flip side of that, policy approaches to livability often support uh, and strengthen climate policies. So our panelists are going to dig deeper into some, some of the specific climate and livability uh, solutions, including putting a <coughs> in carbon pollution, uh, and how that can enhance our quality of life in our cities, our towns, our village centers, and our rural communities. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll have Jason, if you want to introduce yourself, and Deb. Sure. Hi everyone. I'll stand up so I can see everybody. My name is Jason Van Dreisch. I'm the Deputy Director at Local Motion. We are Vermont's walk and bike advocacy organization. Until recently, working primarily in Chittenden County, last year merged with the Vermont Bike and Pet Coalition and are now uh, spreading out to engage with communities across the state to help people make their communities great places to walk and bike. Oh, introductions. Yes. Hi. Deb Sachs. Um, I wear a number of hats, uh, but today I'm uh, wearing a hat of Net Zero Vermont, <coughs> co executive director. Uh, it used to be Community Climate Action, and now it's Net Zero Vermont. We renamed ourselves because of the urgency of needing to get something done. I will speak today about a project we're working on. Great, thank you. So, Jason, if you will, I'll have you start off here uh, localizing Vermont's transportation. Uh, from walking and biking to car share and transit, transportation choices make life better in Vermont, and the most effective strategies are those that support and link multiple ways of getting out of the car. Um, and Jason's going to talk specifically about Burlington, and then kind of broad in the scope of things as we go along. Sure. So, um, just put up here to start Local Motion's website because I want you to just get a, a, a visual of, of what we're about and um, why we exist and what the connection is between biking and walking and uh, climate action. Um, obviously, if you're biking or walking, you're not using fossil fuels to get around. The flip argument that we hear often is, well, you know, nobody's going to walk or bike for a long trip, and it's the long trips that actually uh, account for the biggest share of our carbon pollution. So walking and biking is never going to be more than a tiny slice of the solution. And the way we counter that is that walking and biking are, in many ways, the catalyst. If you, if you make a community walkable and bikeable, and if you help people shift to a mindset where the immediate default isn't get in your car, but rather is, how do I want to get to where I'm going? That opens up all kinds of possibilities for um, people having a much broader mix of transportation solutions that work for them. Because to be honest, for most of us right now, the default is you walk out your door, you hop in your car, and you go. And for some trips, that will continue to be the only viable solution, no question. What we're trying to shift, though, is that un questioning assumption right out of the gate that you can just get in your car and go. Because in many cases there are other solutions. And what we find is that walking and biking are the things that are 
easiest to build a movement around when you're talking about other modes of transportation. Um, it's not very easy to build a uh, um, movement, a activism, um, uh, community action around car sharing or carpooling or taking the bus. All those are good things and people do them. They don't get jazz the way people get about, I want my community to be a place where I can bike. I want a sidewalk in my village. Um, those are the kinds of things that you can build a movement around. And then, once you start to shift the community conversation about how people get around and what it means to have options for getting around, then it's much easier for all of these other pieces that are, to be honest, much higher impact, but much less sexy, to start to uh, gain some momentum. So we see walking and biking as the gateway drug, if you will, for <laughs> transportation uh, system change. Um, so, I know, Deb, you've got a bunch of pieces of that picture, too. Do we want to pass back and forth? Do you want to, how do you want to, how do you want to proceed with this? Because honestly, Deb and I work together a lot, yeah. and what we do is very intertwined. I, I like that approach. Okay. If, if you're yeah. comfortable with that, Deb, we can yeah. definitely. And then just yeah. interrupt us with questions. Yeah, yeah. J Jason's points are, are good. They're great because he has, a, in terms of building movement, locomotion has a long history. And I have a long history as well, working with many of you in the room. Then I have feeling in balance because I just no noticed that my yoga instructor is here today. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very surprised, Jean, and thank you for coming. Um, but that, that's what it is. It's hope and living in balance. And net zero communities really is about living with less energy. If there's one point that I want to leave you with today is that the future is going to be different. We are going to have a lot less energy and we need to stand together and work at this problem of our future with that, with less energy. And that is, in our community's great hope, with a carbon pollution tax, we can shift and redirect resources to those things that we need to happen and happen faster. We are going too slow. With a comprehensive energy plan, I look at the hundreds of objectives in that energy <coughs> plan, and I'm hopeful that we can do much better than that because we're going too slow. And today, we see it all around us. 60 degrees on the 19th. November, you know, we have change with us. And I see young people, I see old people, older people, and we're all here together to work on this big problem. Um, some of the points that I wanted to make is, and what was asked was, what is a net zero energy community? And that is living with less energy, greatly reduced energy in fossil fuels from heating to transportation. And we work together on this. Most of my life has been spent on working on the transportation problem because I learned to like working on difficult things. The future is not going to be the car, so how do we get around in Vermont? How do we get around in a small state? And there's great opportunity. <coughs> Could you just show a map, um, Jason? One map that I'd like to show you. This map is of downtown Montpelier. This is a project that I'm working on right now. And uh, what it illustrates is how that red right there is surface parking. More than half of downtown Montpelier and many of our downtowns in Vermont, we were held hostage to the car. And that's not a good use of resources. And so we need to take this land use problem and grab onto it and displace that demand for parking and start living downtown. Start getting around with mass transit. Start having the, the opportunity to have those last mile, if you, if you will, you get off the bus and you've got to get up the hill or get down to your workplace. We need to grab that and understand what it is. And I need your help, Jason needs your help, in building this movement. And the other day, I was sitting down with uh, GMTA Transit, and Donna, her name's Donna, and she works for GMT. And she, she pulls out this map, and I'm going to send this around to you. This happens to be hot off the press, the Mad River Valley Green Mountain Transit. 
And so I'm going to pass this around to take, take one. And you know, if you want to look at what we can do, this is one example of what we can do. A lot of our resource maps, who, who knows how to read a transit map, for example? Most people do. That's really great because a lot of people don't, and a lot of people don't even pick it up. But what we can do is we can start to begin to help promote at the local level making our communities more livable by helping to put things on maps that help people to see and get around by transit. It's one easy example. So this map here, if you've got transit in your community, what's around it that you can begin to help the people that are disadvantaged, that don't have a car, that want to get to their, uh, their appointment, or their medical appointment, or to their job, or to their interview? We are seeing real problems in rural Vermont. Now, I'll call it more of a small Vermont than rural. But in small Vermont, we can help boost our communities, take, take this problem, and start to address it. Um, and so the project that I'm working on is a uh, design competition to help imagine uh, Montpelier in 2030 net zero. That community, as well as Burlington, has drawn a line in the sand. They said, we want to be net zero by 2030. Well, what does that mean? How do you get there? And at a community level, that's really hard. But we can get there. We can get there by getting active and pushing decision makers, telling, telling them the 25 design firms from around the world registered for this competition. And in September, 20, 20 teams from around the world submitted plans for Montpelier. It was winnowed down by voters. 700 people walked into a gallery and voted for their favorite design. And five are going forward to help the city displace the car, displace the demand for parking, look at downtown, bring in transit, bring in rail, put a gondola in town from downtown to National Life. These are all projects in their own right would be the right direction. And how do we get there? We start with carbon pollution tax. We can't get there without it because we need to redirect resources and invest in those things that we want, not car. I'll leave it there. Yeah, so I've got a question for you. Um, you said we're going to have to live with less energy. And I think one of the biggest challenges about moving forward is using language that doesn't scare people. And um, one of the things we've heard is, what do I have to give up now? So, um, so those, that language is, Frank, you, you, can I interrupt you? Yeah, sure. Can I interrupt you? Sure. No, no. I'm reading a book called, uh, I'm right and you're an idiot. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Framing. Yeah. If there's one point that I can make is that we need to use energy differently. We need to rely on making our own energy and we don't have to be living too differently than what we are. It's just... Well, we may or may not, but I, but I think one of the ways to overcome, first of all, is to frame it in positive terms, but also to build excitement. I mean, if I were in Montpelier and there's a gondola ride available up to National Life, I'd just take the fun of it. So, you know, you know, things like that that are exciting. I think the point that you make is key, and I'll, I'll pick up on that and run with it for a minute um, and circle back to something that I said um, when I <coughs> launched in, which is that um, something that has broad resonance for a lot of people is having more transportation choices. And when I talk to people about, do you want to live someplace where you have the option to walk out your front door safely with your dog? Um, and not worry about getting run over. Where you have the option to hop on your bike and go for a bike ride with your kid. Where you have the option to uh, take the bus some days instead of driving. Um, where you have the option to um, uh, you know, drive three miles to a park and ride and hop a ride with somebody else. Almost everybody says, yeah, that would make life better. Most people drive more than they want to. And people don't want their ability to drive taken away, and that is most definitely not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is tilting 
the playing field, which right now is tilted so steeply in favor of driving everywhere for everything, such that it's a little more even, and people have the option, the choice, to get around in other ways. Because consistently what um, the average person finds is that when you have more choices, when you aren't always defaulting to driving no matter what for everything, for anywhere you need to go, the life is better. You need to have that option to drive because sometimes it's the only option that makes sense. But life is better if you have other options as well. And that's fundamentally what, what we're looking at. And one of the pieces, to echo what Deb said, one of the key pieces of tilting the playing field back in favor of other options being viable is the carbon tax. Another key piece is addressing parking and how ubiquitous and free parking is. Um, there's a really interesting process going on in Burlington right now that I think is, um, could play out really well at a smaller scale in other smaller cities and village centers across Vermont, which is an in-depth look at parking where the city has reframed the issue from how do we make sure we have enough parking everywhere no matter what to how do we make sure that people have access to downtown. With parking being a key part of that, but where parking is located and managed and priced such that there are resources for other ways for people to get access to downtown. Some of the things that they found when they looked at parking in depth in Burlington is that A, there is no parking shortage, there's just poor parking management. There are tons of off-street parking spaces in structured garages that are empty every day and every night simply because there isn't access to them. So better management is key. And B, um, a big part of downtown congestion and traffic in Burlington is people driving around looking for parking spaces. <laughs> and so they're looking right now at the economics of parking and figuring out how you price parking effectively such that um, what they aim for is 85% occupancy um, on the streets. Because at 85% occupancy, you can always find a space on the street if you really need one. Um, but uh, you're making good use of the resource. And in many parts of Burlington, at many times, the occupancy of on-street parking was actually much higher. And if it's higher than 85%, what that tells you is that you're not charging enough for parking. So it's a similar issue to uh, the uh, carbon tax, in that we're not charging enough for gas, and as a result, we're using too much of it. Same thing with parking, we're not charging enough in Burlington, and especially in communities where on-street parking is free, and therefore we're using too much of it. Um, so you'll get things like um, people who work downtown parking on the street all day long and running out every two hours to plug the meter because it's the cheapest way for them to park. What we need as an alternative to that is you bring up the price of on-street parking such that on-street parking spaces are always available but they're being used short term for people who are coming downtown for a couple hours and you lower the prices in the garages, and you lower it especially in the garages that are farther from downtown. There's a giant parking garage right across the street here um, in behind the Hilton that nobody knows is a public parking garage, and that is always three quarters empty. And it is about a four minute walk from downtown. That garage should be like $3 a day to park, and it should be advertised like heck for everybody who works downtown. There's lots of things like that that we can do that shift the dynamics of how our transportation system works. And what we need to be looking for is all of these little nudges that collectively will take us from a, uh, a situation where right now um, it's tilted like this so heavily in favor of driving that everybody just kind of slides by default into hopping in your car and, and, and going. Because it's literally like a, an uphill scramble to do anything else. To something where you've got a level playing field and you look at your options, and you choose what works best for you in a given day. Carbon tax is one of those pieces. Better pricing of parking is another. Um, I want to talk today also a little bit about how we use our streets and some smart, fast strategies for rethinking and redesigning streets as places that work for more than just getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible in your car. So I'm going to pause there just to see if Anyone has any questions right now in the back? I just have a quick question of what this looks like for more rural communities, because for Burlington and Mount Kelier, like this is a totally relevant conversation, but I think in terms of the carbon pollution tax, 
catering to some more rural communities and meeting those needs is really important. And I'm curious what this looks like in areas without a village center or where public parking is less of a conversation. Absolutely. We will get there and that's more dead end of things. I work, my, my focus is much more on um, uh, community centers at all scales, including smaller villages, not just the Burlingtons and Montpeliers of Vermont, but places where the, um, um, the, the scale and pattern of human settlement is conducive to walking and biking being a regular part of the mix. That said, you know, we need bikeable roads between communities. Um, we need rural roads that are safe for people to head out on foot for you know, exercise, to walk their dog, you name it. So walking and biking are issues that resonate across the state. From a transportation and carbon uh, perspective, our focus is much more on the more densely settled uh, locations throughout Vermont. So I'll speak more to that and leave the, the broader statewide rural to rural um, piece of it to death because that's more her specialty. The back. So this isn't so much statewide, but it does touch on the community to community yeah. questions. You know, even South Burlington to Burlington. Picture biking from South Burlington to Burlington. How do you do it easily? Um, you don't. Yeah. And so what's what's being done between and among those two yes. communities and other communities? You know, my my community is Burlington to Richmond. Yep. And coming home Forget about it. Yeah. yeah, now you take your life in your hands. I'll, I can speak to that as well. Let's start. Um, let's. I, I'm going to take a, an approach of um, kind of from densest and most populated, working outwards, and that's not at all intended as a um, uh, any indication of relative importance. It's just an easy way to organize thoughts about how you address. Um, the challenge of making walking and biking an option um, in different kinds of communities. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we're doing in Burlington, uh, mainly as a way of showing you how we are uh, working to accelerate the pace of change, because honestly the pace of change has been glacial in Burlington, but we see, and, and in communities around Vermont, for making walking and biking better options. But we see strategies from elsewhere in the country where the pace of change has picked up dramatically, and I want to talk a little bit about how that happens. Then after I do that, why don't we switch gears to you, Deb, and, and talk more about the intercommunity issues, um, and then see where we go from there. So what I'm showing you right here is hot off the press, it's not even released yet, which is why I'm not handing out printed copies of it, because it's not quite ready for release. Um, but I'm going to walk you very rapidly through four maps. You don't need to see the details, but it's basically, I want you to get the big picture of where Burlington is right now for biking infrastructure and what we're proposing for the next five years. So this is, oops, oops, oops. that red map keeps popping up. Yeah, there we go. Um, this right here is a map of current bike infrastructure in Burlington, the sort of core city area. This is the old North End, here's downtown, here's the waterfront, UVM is right here, here's the sort of northern part of the South End. Right there is City Hall Park, smack in the middle. As you can see, we do not have a network, which, is, um, which actually uh, makes it all the more amazing that bike, there's as much biking going on in Burlington as there is. Um, here is what we think can happen next year. Now, to be clear, this is a very rudimentary network, and it's a network that relies heavily on a sort of quiet back streets. All of these dashed lines here are what's called neighborhood greenways, which is where you don't actually put in bike lanes. You look for the quiet streets where there's very low traffic, and you paint these things here called super sheriffs, which are giant green rectangles with a bike symbol on them, smack in the middle of the travel lane. And basically what that says is, hey, this is A, a priority street for biking, for, for it says to drivers, this is a priority street for biking, go slow and look out. And it says to people on bikes, hey, here's a, here's a route for you to bike, take this route, um, you're not going to go wrong. So you'll see a lot of those throughout town, in the first year, and that's one of the key strategies. Look for ways that you can highlight existing back streets, and every village will have these. We're looking at similar things in St. Johnsbury, a very small city, um, looking at similar routes in... Um, uh, Linden, um, all kinds of places where you basically say, how can we get around one or two streets off of 
the main drag and make it easier for people to get where they're going simply by highlighting the fact that bikes are welcome and that this is a good place to bike. Um, one of the things that I've seen consistently um, in Vermont, uh, as I've looked at this over the last few years, is that communities tend to try to make bike infrastructure as unobtrusive as possible. Like, we'll just kind of tuck it in and around the edge and hope nobody really notices. This is exactly the opposite. This is, hey, bike's here! And that is, I think, a key change that we need to make, not only from the perspective of making it clear where it's safest to bike, but also from the perspective of being loud and proud about the fact that biking is a part of life and could be a much bigger part of life in communities across Vermont if we just acknowledge it and put it out in the foreground. This has zero negative impact on driving. It simply is a statement of affirmation that this is a good place to bike. A um, couple pieces in here are actual bike lanes, strategic changes to what is existing in Burlington. One example, there are currently <coughs> one-way northbound bike lanes on both Union Street and Willard Street, which means we have two bike lanes going in the same direction and no bike lane going south. So what we're asking the city to do is to take Willard Street, scrub out all the lines, and put it in the other way and go south. Um, one of the side benefits of that is that incidentally it will actually increase on street parking on this street because of how the side streets align. So Roe is looking for ways to sell um, ideas based on multiple benefits. But the idea here is in one year we get a basic network, what's called a minimum grid. Um, and we use green paint not only in these um, neighborhood greenway networks, but also you can, as you can see right here, whenever an actual bike lane crosses a street. So every one of these dots here is a place where a bike lane hits a significant cross street. And instead of having the bike lane disappear as you go across the intersection, you actually highlight it. It's the exact opposite of how it's done now, because now, right when you most need an indication that, hey, bikes are crossing here, there's absolutely no indication that you should expect a bike at all. Yeah? I, I, it's just to, to clarify, yep. the, uh, the, the, um, the highlighted uh, uh, sign yep. is, is going to be everywhere that the, uh, on the same roads that the uh, uh, image over on the top left is? No, they're actually complementary. This here <coughs> is um, in a street along the length of a block. Every 100 feet or so, you'd have one of these, just chunk and then line of, a line of sight distance, you'd see another one. So it's kind of like right on the street wayfinding. Bike, bike, bike. These here are on the streets that have bike lanes and therefore don't need these because there's a lane along the side of the street. But when you get to the intersection, you've got green to carry you across the cross street. But the, 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 the shared principle of the two of them, though, is consistent use of green paint to say to all users of the transportation system, expect bikes here and to say to people on bikes, this is your best route. But isn't it confusing to have the, uh, the, that leftmost symbol? Because like, wouldn't, wouldn't it be unclear where, where the cyclist should be uh, cycling? I, the idea is that they're actually biking right there on that green box, that it's a shared street. There's not a separate bike lane, either because there isn't space or because it's simply not necessary because it's a very quiet street. For instance, this right here, for anybody who knows Burlington, this is Loomis, Grant, uh, Peru, and Sherman Streets. We call it the Old North End Wiggle. Hardly anybody drives this unless you live on these streets because it goes jog, 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 jog as it goes across the Old North End. It's a great way to get across the Old North End on a bike because there's practically no traffic. So you could just put these down the middle of the street and it basically tells people, hey, this is your best route for now to go on a bike. So let's keep going. Um, I don't want to take too long with this. Um, this here is what we'd like to see happen in 2018. And what you see here is we start to fill in the gap. Winooski Avenue through downtown go from four lanes to three and put bike lanes on both sides. Pearl Street bike lanes. Um, North Champlain Street. Basically, the first year is find the easiest, lowest uh, resistance way to get something on the ground. Uh, build excitement, get some green out there, make it so that people say, wow, I actually could bike. And then in the second year, build on that momentum and fill in the gaps that require more political capital, a little more of a stronger movement to move them forward. To be clear, none of these second year projects require major construction. On Winooski Ave, um, you could put in bike lanes there today. We're not going to do it today because um, it'll be a heavy lift in terms of 
building the political momentum to make it happen. But what, uh, what you can do there is exactly what they did on North Avenue earlier this year. You just change the striping and voila, you've got space. Bye. Thanks, Jason. And yeah. My transition here. Yep. Um, just yes. want to return to some of the questions in the back. Yes. Uh, How many live in a rural area? Oh, wow. Great. So just about half of the people here, or more than half, live in a rural town and maybe have the same question about what, what do we do in the rural areas? Do you have a solution for the rural areas? Well, I would hope that the cities, our big cities of Vermont, will be, you know, sort of a uh, leaders and helpful in terms of seeing what's going on. Well, what's happening in Burlington, everybody asks. And they're looking at low-cost options to actually see a project on the ground. Um, so we're in the context of the carbon pollution tax. But we as individuals in our communities know that that policy has to come. And that's what this dialogue is about today, correct? We've got to get to the pollution tax and stand together and understand how we can actually redirect both dollars and resources to the kinds of things that we need to keep the dollars moving in a community. That's what we're trying to do. $1.8 billion leaves the state each year for fossil fuel, for fuels. And we want to capture those dollars in Vermont by offering a more robust <coughs> transportation system, have our transit really working, have it affordable and reliable. And so it doesn't go to every corner. Who, has a, who does not have a transit uh, option in their community? Lesser so, but still mind-boggling. I don't know if you know this, but Vermont spends half its public transit dollars on a volunteer driver. <coughs> volunteer drivers take people to their appointments who don't have cars, and we pay the mileage for that. And we pay a guaranteed ride home if people do uh, carpool or if they take transit, we'll offer them a ride home if they miss the bus or didn't come. That's the state of Vermont offering a $70 cab ride home. Of all rural states, Vermont is spending the most on public transit than most other rural states in the country. And that's because we have a committed administration. We want to continue that commitment, and that's really necessary. So if we can tax the bad and redirect it to the good, then we can do these things faster. So we don't have a specific thing for you, but if we have, and one can open it up for the dialogue, maybe we can we can wind up some creative ideas to help the rural areas get to that problem, get to the problem. I, of, I think what we need is kind of an all of the above, in the sense that you know there are many folks here who don't have a, a, a transit option in your community, but um, you know. The park and rides, for instance, around the state are very heavily used, and our transit systems have done a good job of turning those park and rides into bus stops. So you drive five miles, park at a park and ride, and then take the bus for 20 miles instead of driving for 25 miles. We need a lot more work to make those uh, transit options convenient and frequent enough that they work for folks, but we've seen that that can happen. You know, it's just starting with things like the um, Burlington Montpelier link which now runs often enough that if I have a meeting in Montpelier, um, I will often take the bus there and back instead of driving. And it means I get an hour of work time in each direction instead of 45 minutes of sitting behind the wheel and you know doing nothing. Um, so uh, I think at the same time as we're putting together that network, we also need to be looking at what are the connections that get people to a statewide transportation network? Because it's never going to come to every single town. But if you can, you know, make a third of your trip in your car and two thirds by some other option, then you're you're right. getting there. Being being an energy detective, and one of the things we're noting in Montpelier is imagine everybody losing one car in their household. You know, if they get rid of one car, then we'll have achieved a miraculous place. It's I like, like shedding one car rather than losing one car. <laughs> shedding one car, good. Save one save car. five, seven, save. eight thousand bucks a year. Yeah. But if you're an energy detective like I am all the time, I'm kind of saying, okay, what's on these transit lines or where's the closest one? And begin to make a map in your community of what is there. How do you get people from one spot to another from your roadways and start to understand these things? If you yourselves can help with that, it's going to be enormous to the transit providers as they, the planners, that are looking at future, at the future of what transit is. 
And we need trains, we need transit, and we need the resources going into shared mobility options. The future will be shared cars rather than each of us owning a car. Uber is coming, technology is here, handheld solutions. Yes, in rural Vermont, will we see this in, you know, Canaan, Vermont? Well, no, but I put a van pool on the road using state of Vermont dollars because 10 van pools is equivalent to one fixed transit system. So the cost, 10 van pools of 12 to 15 <coughs> people in each van. The van pool running from Canaan and Colebrook, New Hampshire down to Orleans bringing 25, 30 people to work each day for a fraction of the cost. Lowered their individual household outlay for that one worker by $3,000 a year, even with these low cars. For people who don't know, how do you set one of those up? Oh, um, well, what I didn't show you is connectingcommuters.org, uh, Go Vermont. Go Vermont is the state's clearinghouse. Connectingcommuters.org is the state's clearinghouse on anything transportation. If you want to bring that up online. So, you know, we talked a lot about transportation. I'm not sure we met your expectations today, but livable communities begin with the energy picture. Livable communities begin with addressing the land use and transportation connection. And it is the, the you know, people in the future, you said 2066 in one of your questions, what will it be like in 2066? Your, your ideal vision. Yeah. My yeah. ideal vision. What a livable Vermont would be. What a livable Vermont will be. Well, I don't want to be too negative. <laughs> so my positive, my positive thing is hope. Yes. And hope be, meaning we can live in our downtowns. We're going to need to live in our downtowns. And our rural areas are going to be for farmers and foresters and those people that are, are working the land, for local foods, for our forest products, and for the things that we need in rural Vermont. In our downtowns, we need housing that's affordable, that's accessible for everybody, all ages. We're concerned in our downtowns that we don't have, you know, places for youth to be. Jason, my friend, is working on making Burlington the most attractive community in the Northeast, maybe even in the country. Because Burlington and these communities, even villages of Bethel and Royalton, who are wrestling with how do we get people, they don't have enough, unemployment so low that they can't get enough workers. GW Plastics, Darn Tough Socks, these companies want to grow and they're having to reach way out to get people to work for them. And so what does that mean? They're calling me, because I work for Go Vermont, and they're saying, Dad, we don't have enough workers. We got this big project that's in. We can't get it done. What do we do? All right, sit down and let's talk turkey about what we need for employees to get to where they need to go and do it affordably on low income jobs. Let me piggyback off of that. I, I hope what you're seeing here is that to make the transportation picture work, first of all, we need the carbon tax because we need to re-level the playing field and that's a fundamental piece of things. We see over and over that the demand for van pools, transit ridership, all of these things goes up. When the price of gas goes up, when the price of gas goes back down, it craters. People respond to those economic cues and we need a consistent economic cue that says our policy as a state is to move in this direction. So the carbon tax sets the baseline that makes all of this stuff possible. In that context, what, what Deb has been talking about is how do we knit the pieces together across the whole landscape? So you've got the van pools, you've got the transit systems, you've got the, the, the car share technology, you've got everything that you need for people to get community to community, those longer distances, in more energy efficient and more cost efficient ways than um, driving alone in your car and footing that entire bill yourself. My piece of the picture is much more focused on, okay, what do you have where you live or where you're getting to that makes it so that that community is a place where you actually want to get out and walk and bike and at that local scale you've got those options that uh, allow you to get around without a car at all. Not only because uh, that's part of the transportation picture that we're talking about here, but also because it helps what, it, it, it's part of what helps make a community the kind of place that people want to settle, want to stay, want to invest, and want to help make that community flourish. People want to live in places where they uh, can walk and can bike and where the community is 
alive with um, uh, an active street life. People don't really like living places where um, the streets are dead and all you see is cars driving around. I want to show one very quick example of what this looks like at a micro scale. Um, so we take it from the big picture all the way down to a single intersection, which really would apply across anything from Burlington to you know a village of 800 or 1,000 people. Any place where you've got intersections and you want to have more of a people-centered, walkable, bikeable community. This is the intersection of St. Paul and Howard here in Burlington. Um, and this is a design I did in the space of about two hours on my computer after having gone out and messed around with chalk and a tape measure on the street of something that uh, the city of Burlington could do for a thousand bucks in a weekend uh, next spring if they want. What you see here is essentially we're taking a whole lot of extra space in this intersection that's really not needed for cars and reallocating it for people. Um, and that does two things. One, it slows cars down so you're more comfortable crossing the street. And two, it gives you shorter distances to cross and frees up space for people to safely bike. This right here is a line of paint and flexible plastic posts. And you can see it goes right with where cars are driving. So basically it says, you know, you don't really need this for driving. Let's cordon that off. And instead of this crosswalk being this long, it's suddenly a third shorter. This one here is cut in half. It gives you the space to have these bike lanes that cross the street. Right here, instead of crossing uh, 28 feet on this crosswalk, you lop off 4 feet on either side, and you've got 20 feet to cross. Um, same thing here, 22 feet, a little bit wider because this is the main drag. This is Route 7 coming in. All of this is possible with very low budget um, if a community is willing to actually take action. And what it requires as a public works department that is willing to stick their necks out a little bit and not study everything to death for five years. Yes? Are you working with the trends to make this statewide, this, this concept of color and symbols and stuff? Because if you're trying to sell us yep. a world Vermont to come to Burlington for yep. or whatever, yep. we're going to have to know what we're seeing when we get here. Yes, there is a draft uh, VTRANS, what's called engineering instruction, <coughs> right now on the desk of the head engineer who signed these things, that uh, calls for exactly this, using green paint in intersections um, for bike lanes. And how are you going to get that word out? Uh, we are working with um, the uh, with VTrans, with training that they do through uh, Vermont Rural Roads, um, which is a network of uh, road foremen from across the state um, where they share best practices about road development. We work with AARP, which um, has huge reach across the state. We work with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Um, there's a bunch of different ways, um, but you're right, the key thing is for people across the state to hear it. But the other really important thing is to start to see models on the ground. And not just in Burlington, but for instance, the Barry Montpelier Road um, uh, recently got an upgrade with bike lanes. It's going to get green paint just like this. On the on the topic of making sure people know what the what all the symbols mean, I think in Burlington a really important area is how do you convey that to the new students who are coming in each year? Because you yeah. see a, an influx of bikers, which is great, but they're you know they don't know how to use the infrastructure. So I think working with the with the colleges and universities to make that part of the orientation to the city is important. Absolutely, and that's one of the benefits of green, is that once you get it going, it becomes completely self-explanatory and obvious. People see green, and they know that that means bikes. Question right here. Uh, I'm just curious, kind of what obstacles maybe have you faced, especially in regards to like, the parking lots situation, um, with like historical building preservation and like all these those, those other arguments that make that maybe more difficult. I live in Barrie, and um, it's very hard to get past. There's no grocery store out there. So there's, there's like, no what? Grocery store. Yeah. Yeah. You can go to Dollar General, but yeah. you can go to Hannaford's or Pick and Save and, or uh, Price Shopper. Sorry, um, I'm new to the area, <laughs> but it's just very difficult. Um, I think one of the issues that the grocery store faced was um, because there was like a sort of building rule or something that they couldn't put one in downtown. And I just see that as obviously a multifaceted issue, but well. I was born in Barrie, so oh, okay, I know no. Barrie. Um, and you're right. You're absolutely right. We, I mean, you're hitting on something that's very necessary. Is what's the basic needs we need in our communities? And when uh, a grocery store can't sustain, or the type of grocery store that's the model can't sustain itself, 
how do we, what are we doing to kill a small amount of costs and the ability to have a community-based shopping and her needs met? So no answer. Sure, that's, yeah. something to, that's something that's something you can take the bull by the horn. Yeah. No? <laughs> Questions. Uh, we only have one, one other one other thing related to parking that's important. The traditional way to manage parking is to uh, the municipalities regulate parking is that new developments are required us to have a certain minimum number of parking spaces per say thousand feet of commercial building space. And in a traditional downtown that where the, the, the pattern of development predates cars, that makes things like grocery stores basically impossible. What many communities are starting to move towards is eliminating minimum parking requirements and allowing the developer to determine what actually makes sense for the context. Because a, a grocery store that's right in the middle of downtown Barrie will actually get a lot of its traffic by foot and won't need as big of a parking lot. And um, one really good example, the village of Morrisville, a couple of years ago, eliminated minimum parking requirements in the village. Uh, because they saw it as the key impediment to reinvestment in the village because you couldn't build anything because there wasn't room to build a parking lot that you were required to build. Have to well. And then, you and what they, the yeah, what they saw is two million dollars in investment in Morrisville in the space of a couple of years in tiny little Morrisville once they took out that, that obstacle to um, uh, building at a scale and in a way that actually fits Morrisville. the village. So real quick before we do that, and as we're wrapping up here, just want to plug it to tell your story as we're sort of pulling the pieces together and you're connecting the dots for what it means to you and local communities and big policy approaches to climate change, including putting the price on carbon pollution. Think of your story. I believe you have something in your packet. You can write it down, take a few moments, and then find uh, Emma, who is helping report stories, and that's part of today. I think she's downstairs in the main lobby there. So I encourage you to do some thinking on that, come up with your line, uh, and join her to, to share your story. I'd be um, happy to help you formulate your story if you don't know how to put words. Yeah, well, and again, we have we have examples uh, and staff to help you if you need inspiration on that, too. So. And if your story is about making your community a better place to walk and bike, email me, jason at localmotion.org. Local. So, and we have one or two more minutes. I want to continue to open up broadly. Um, yes. So, Three quick things. Um, there was a book written maybe eight, ten years ago that built the case for the real cost of gasoline that we're paying in, in, in taxes now at that time it was about ten bucks a gallon. So the carbon tax we're talking about is, is minuscule compared to that. But it does make a trend, it makes people think. So I think it's very important to realize that what we're trying to do is turn the tide and let carbon tax go down. Right. Good I, I, leave, I live in, in, in four miles off the blacktop in Tunbridge. But I would love to be able to pick up people. I drive back and forth to Brody. My partner lives in Brody. So I make that trip at least once a week. I'm not a commuter in a sense. I'm right. a weekend commuter or something. But I would love an app that said, hey, I'm looking for a ride in the next hour or whatever. I would, I, would, I would pull into Mount Pillar and pick someone up it's coming. and drive. And, it's coming. And, and one of the way the transition to that is to contact the transit agency and you can become a volunteer driver and get on the list. Okay. And, and, you can and, and I do Neighbors Helping Neighbors in Tunbridge, which is a free service, all volunteers. doesn't collect any money to help people go to doctors. We, we need to know about you on, on the list. There's a um, question back here. Go ahead. Okay, the, um, there's a program that was promoted in the uh, Montpelier um, master plan a few years ago uh, called a um, smart jitney service. Yes. Uh, I tried to get that going on Montpelier and was unfortunately thwarted. But uh, uh, and since then I've moved to St. Albans. But uh, the um, uh, I think it's you know it's really low hanging fruit, and, and of course you can't call it smart jitney. You know maybe something like Woodchuck Express or something like that. And, uh, I like that Woodchuck Express. And I like uh, that. you know basically it's just using the tools that Go Vermont has already put in place. Yes. They, Go Vermont is very exciting for a transportation nerd like me. Uh, they they have some really great stuff, and it's it's entirely compatible. 
uh, with making uh, a Woodchuck Express work. So it, it, it's it's very exciting times for smart transportation. I, I have goosebumps because you're you're the person we need to work to stand together to make this happen. Yeah. I think that's a that's a great way to wrap it up right there. Uh, I believe Jason and Deb will be here if you have more questions yep. available to speak with them. Um, but thank you both for coming today and uh, providing some great insight.